Well, Eric, we are in the middle of our life lesson series, and I'm really excited about today. I don't know if I've ever actually told you, um, I have a, genuinely, I have a very secret love for manure. I love the smell. I don't know why really? it is. It's actually a problem. My parents make fun of me all the time about it. <laughs> uh, but in this life lesson, we're talking about the benefits of manure. Could you explain outside of the smell for whatever reason why I like it? I don't, yeah. well, my maybe mom, some rodeo. My mom had the same thing. Yeah. She grew up on a dairy farm. And it actually brought back good memories for her. I don't have that excuse. <laughs> I yeah, I'm concerned about you. Yours is more of a concerning <laughs> thing. My mom's was explainable. Uh, yeah, so the idea of what, what this means for us, you know, in our sort of dialect here at Ellerslie, is manure is supposed to be sort of a negative thing, even though you find it very attractive. Yes, yeah, strangely. It's Most problem. people are going to rank it as a unpleasant thing. You know, they find it on their shoe. They're not happy, right? They find it in their life, in their living room. They're not happy. It, it's, it doesn't belong there. And when we end up with manure in our life, like someone you know, that is a little uh, unhappy or unkind sticks it on our doorstep, we have a tendency to look at that as a negative thing. However, what the kingdom of heaven is built on and this is the reason it's a life lesson for us. It's sort of a game changer moment in your Christian life when you finally see manure for how God sees it, which you obviously have a head start. And that is, this is a gift. This is actually something that can make your garden grow. And if you take it, receive it with joy and thanksgiving and till it into your garden, you actually end up with a greener garden, greater growth in your spiritual life as opposed to when you reject it. When you reject it, you complain about it, it actually can bring you down. And the enemy's tactic with his manure pile actually works then, and it destroys our inner life. But when we agree with it, when we embrace it, and when we till it, it actually transforms us. That's so good. I think one of the problems we have in just modern society, probably even the church very specifically, is we we don't go through a process where we allow God to till into the soil of our souls, mm -hmm. that we we either you know cherish it somehow or we put a box over it so that nobody can touch it. And it's interesting how manure that's not tilled in becomes hardened, it becomes petrified, it becomes it actually ruins the garden. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting if we don't allow God to go through that process where He is refining us, He is sanctifying, He's taking that which the enemy meant for evil, and he puts it deep within our soul and actually brings about the goodness of that, it is amazing how it actually causes the bitterness and the anger and the frustration, and, and it, in a sense, it became, becomes a twist in our lives. And I, and I think the reason we look at manure in such a negative light, besides the fact that it, there are problems with it, I will admit that just for clarity's sake. <laughs> but, but when we don't allow God to, to actually leverage it then it actually becomes a very problematic thing in our garden. Mm -hmm. Would you talk about maybe some practical implications of this? Like, mm -hmm. uh, like one of our favorite stories is Richard Rembrandt yeah. uh, being thrown in a prison, or uh, we, we could pick a variety of stories, but you just want to maybe flesh this out. Like, what, what does this mean practically for God to do a work of tealing manure into our lives? Yeah. If you go through any of my Daily Thunder series, you're probably going to hear something about this, because almost every single one of them is somehow going to gravitate in this direction. It's a big part of my life and your life is attitude and approach to difficulty, to challenge. And so like in my Theodore Roosevelt uh, series, uh, I have one that's called the Buffalo, the Bully Buffalo Hunt. And it, I mean, you could almost say this is the theme of it, is the uh, benefits of manure. But Richard Wormbrandt, it's a, it's a great story. And that is uh, he, he suffers in prison, even solitary confinement for a long time. He's tortured and for years. I don't remember if it was nine years the first go around. It was a long time. And uh, their entire goal was to break him so that they could leverage his voice as a pastor to the other pastors to say, look, I learned my lesson. The communists are right. God doesn't exist, you know, that type of a thing. But he wouldn't break. And when he finally was released, uh, the Christians came up to him. It's like, so what was it like? And he made a strange statement. He said, well, uh, they gave us instruments. He's like, who gave you instruments? The guards. The, wait a minute, wait a minute. The communist guards gave you instruments? And he goes, yeah. And with those instruments, we praise the Lord. Well, well, <laughs> wait a minute, Richard. You, 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 in prison, the communist guards who hate God gave you instruments. Yes. And with those instruments, you praise the Lord. Yes. 
And so come to find out, uh, they gave him chains. And with those chains, he praised the Lord. But the way he looked at it was completely different than the rest of us. We look at those chains as weights, as hindrances, as impediments. And he looked at them as instruments, as an opportunity. Oh, thank you, guards. I, I receive these chains as an opportunity now to worship my Lord in a creative new way. He says, sing to me a new song. I'm doing that, God. I'm singing with my chains. And that is a profound picture that I think has had a, you know, it's had a big impact on both of us, but it's an attitude of life that if you start cultivating it, it actually changes the tenor of every single situation you enter into. It's so good. Uh, Paul in Romans chapter five, I think it's verse three, says that if I'm going to boast on something, we know that Paul boasts about Christ in other parts of his letters, <clears throat> but, in, but in Romans five, I think it's verse three, Paul says that I'm going to boast in my trials. I'm going to boast in my tribulations. I'm going to boast in my persecutions and my hardships. And that really does not make sense, especially in American culture. It, it is interesting how we try to shy away all problems and difficulty. And yet, as as we often teach at Ellerslie, difficulty actually becomes the secret sauce yeah. for the Christian life. It's also interesting to me, and I think it's important maybe to just even mention, um, I, I find myself having to clarify this for our students, that it's not that God has caused the manure always in our life. He'll allow the manure in our life, but he's not an author of sin. So sometimes when when a big pile of manure lands in my garden or my life, it's really easy to start blaming God of like, why did you allow this? And this is all your fault. And God's like, hold it, hold it, hold it. That I did not throw that in there because we know that he is not an author of sin. He, he does not rejoice in wickedness or evil. And yet what is so encouraging for my life is that even though God may not have caused the manure and we see this time and time again in Scripture where the enemy means something for evil, or the, the enemy is meaning something to kill, to steal, and destroy, and yet God says, oh, I could use that. that I, I can take the very thing that the enemy is meaning for destruction and evil to literally cause chaos in your life mm -hmm. and destruction in your soul, and I will leverage that for good. And, and you see this in the story of like Joseph with his brothers, uh, especially Genesis 50. You see this in Paul's declaration, declaration in Romans 8, 28, the... God is leveraging and working all things for the for the for his purpose and for his good. Why? So that he can conform us to his image, which is verse 29. And it, that is so encouraging because there's so many times in my life that I look, I'm like, look at all this manure. <laughs> and it's just like, well, okay, but will I allow God to leverage that in my life to actually bring about greater strength, greater victory, greater freedom, greater joy, greater peace? And, and I love just how you've taught it over the years too, of just how it is allowing God to leverage that in our life, to till that into the soil of our soul that actually creates the platform or the avenue through which we actually get healthier and stronger as a Christian. So again, that which the enemy meant for evil and destruction, God is saying, oh, this is phenomenal. This That's is right. so good. Will you talk about that in light of just the cross? Because I think the cross is maybe the best example of this whole thing. Yeah, because the cross is, it's an evil that is being perpetrated against this pure, loving man known as Jesus. Now, we know him as God as well, but it was an evil perpetrator. So Satan entered into Judas. Well, what is Satan doing in Judas? He's betraying him. He's selling him for 30 pieces of silver. That rascal. It's an evil that is working, and yet God is taking what the enemy is intending to destroy, to snuff out, to undermine God's purposes. And he's like, thank you. The everything about the cross from a Christian lens is taking an evil symbol and turning it into the ultimate picture of triumph. And so the cross itself, why people wear it around their neck, think about that. They, they stick it in their houses up on the wall. It's like, you do know what that is, don't you? It's a symbol of evil. It's a symbol of torture. No, it's a symbol of my redemption. It's a symbol of my salvation. It's a symbol of my rescue. Aha. Right there, that's what the cross is. It's the great converter. It takes what the enemy is meaning or even what we intend for harm. God says, oh, "Let me. I can flip that. I can take your filth and turn you into something pure. I can take your mistakes and redeem them into something that can be leveraged for my gain and glory. When we come to the cross, God takes our mistakes, our mess-ups, our mishaps. He takes the enemy's evil, the enemy's junk, and transforms all of this into his advantage in our life. 
The question is, are we going to take it to the cross? When we come to the cross in every moment of our life, in every season of our life, in every situation, we end up stronger instead of weaker. So that's, you know, Paul's thorn. God, take this away from me. It's a messenger of Satan. And God says, hey, you can leverage this. When you're weak, that's when my strength is made perfect in you. And so to embrace this and to absorb that as a life principle, a life lesson, it's not that easy. Sometimes it takes a few rounds where we have to go through difficulty, complaining, and we come out the other side and we go, huh, okay, all right, God, you did something pretty amazing there. And he's like, yeah, you could know that while you're going through it, as opposed to just after. Second time we go through it, we complain, and then we see it again. We're like, okay, wow, God, I'm really glad you took me through that. And maybe the third time we start to get our game on. We're like, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is hard and I really want to complain, but instead I'm going to rejoice. Instead, I'm going to say, thank you, Lord, for the manure pile on my doorstep. I'm going to take that straight to my garden and turn it into fertilizer. I'm going to till this in so that it becomes a benefit in my soul instead of a hindrance. That's good. I want to ask you a question. I know that if if I'm the one who has thrown manure in someone else's life. Oh, I can't believe you're thinking of doing that. <laughs> but if, if I had, right, uh, I know biblically I need to go and I need to confess. I need to, well, I need to repent before the Lord and I need to make things right with that individual, mm -hmm. right? What happens, or, or maybe I should say, ask you this question. If, if someone has done that in my life, do you have maybe one key thing that someone who's listening just like, look, my life is full of manure. Yeah. Uh, and and I, up to this point, I've not allowed God to till it in the, into my life. Do you have one next step? Is it is it just is it a perspective change? Is is there is it I need to work through forgiveness? Like, do you have a practical thought to give someone who's listening who's just like I okay I know I need to make things right if if I've done the manure, uh -huh. but what if someone's done the manure to me? Uh -huh. Well, when I sit across from people, which this happens a lot, I, and I know you and I are both in the same boat, we're talking to people that have been in this situation. It's usually one of the things they want to work through is they can see something like they know that this is an impediment. They know that they're struggling with something, but they don't know how to get out of it. And typically when they're talking to me, I start chuckling. And that's, that's a common feature in many conversations that I've had where they're like, what are you laughing at? I just, this is good. They're like, what do you, what do you mean it's good? <laughs> and I just chuckle along because I know I know the brilliance of our God, and I know that they are being set up for seeing a conversion of the enemy's yuck in their life. And so it actually gets me excited. And I think part of it is just beginning to just stop and stop playing the devil's game. The devil, his entire game is to get you to have a grievance, is to get you to stumble over unforgiveness, bitterness, or resentment. I mean, that's his entire game. So you're minding your own business, just sort of making your way through life, and someone has an issue, and they throw their issue on you. And the enemy's like, hey, what are you going to do about that? That's an, you know, hey, you need to have a grievance for that. That's the enemy's game. You see, when we begin to sort of like water off a duck's back, you, you take that grievance and you immediately begin to see it just with a new lens. It's like the different glasses. Okay, take off those glasses of grievance, set them over there. This is an opportunity given to you by the Lord to actually showcase his nature on this earth. You have grace in and of yourself, in your own pockets, we struggle with forgiveness. We really do. I mean, a grievance can just weigh us down. It can really injure our souls. But we have a redeemer and he gives us grace to actually see each of these situations redeemed in our life. So if we could say the most micro decision that we could have in that, I'm not exactly sure what's first. If it's to rejoice, if it's to say, thank you, Lord. If it's to say, Lord, I ask for your grace in this moment to actually have a movement of my inner man towards forgiveness, towards life, instead of playing the devil's game. I don't want to play the devil's game anymore. That's good. And I think if somebody wants to take this even deeper, considering coming out here for whether it's our five-week or our one-week programs, could actually be another great step, because we spend a lot of time dealing with this particular issue and diving deep into how do we actually live this thing out practically. And then if they're not doing that, in the meantime, tell us the name of the Buffalo episode again from Teddy Roosevelt. I know it's, I always get it wrong too. Know, it's the number bully, two. The bully Buffalo hunt. Yeah, I think that'd be a great episode for someone to listen to just even process and take this even deeper. So thank you.